Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our ninth Blue Hills Virtual Seminar. Uh, uh, Blue Hills Virtual Seminar is a platform that allows health professionals to discuss current management habits of different health-related topics for better patient care. And uh, this platform is brought to you by Blue Hills Topia. Uh, Blue Hills Topia is a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer. And we aim to be an influential healthcare leader in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge in preventive medicine. And uh, I'm going to be your host, Adam Getacho. Uh, I'm the co-founder co and CTO at Blue Wells Ethiopia. And we are honored to have Dr. Dawit Masfin here with us. Dr. Dawit Masfin is an obstetrician and a gynecologist. And uh, he's going to present to us uh, the approach to tubalectopic pregnancy. And this session is going to last for one hour. Uh, in the beginning of this session, Dr. Dawit will uh, present his slides. And after that, there will be a short Q&A session. So I think it's uh, enough introduction about the platform. And uh, uh, Dr. Dawit, the stage is yours. Yeah. OK, thank you, Adam. Uh, so my name is uh, Dawit. I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist from uh, University of Hawassa. And uh, I'm going to present on uh, approach uh, to uh, tubal ectopic pregnancy. Okay, so as we all know, ectopic pregnancy is one of uh, uh, the emergency gynecology case that we are going to face in, in daily, daily, and daily life of our uh, uh, hospital. So this uh, uh, critical and emergency case will be uh, discussed here. And uh, ectopic pregnancy comprises uh, different uh, parts, but uh, here in this lecture, we are going to uh, uh, focus on mainly on the uh, most common uh, uh, sites of ectopic pregnancy, which is a tubal ectopic pregnancy. <clears throat> so uh, to start with the introduction parts, as we all know, once uh, uh, the egg uh, uh, meets with the sperm cell, it will form the uh, fertilized ovum and this fertilized ovum undergo successive uh, divisions and it will reach to the level of blastocyst. So once it reaches to the blastocyst, it will implant, uh, normally it will implant to the uh, lining of the endometrium. That's a normal place where the uh, fertilized or ovum or the blastocyst has to implant. But in different uh, problems of the fallopian tube, Okay, this uh, implantation could be somewhere other than the endometrial lining. So we call this uh, ectopic pregnancy, which is implantation of the blastocyst anywhere other than the endometrial lining. So epidemiologic wise, uh, according to the Center of Disease and Control, this ectopic preg pregnancy accounts for 2% of pregnancies overall. And in the studies then uh, in 2011 and 13, this uh, pregnancy-related complication account for 2.7% of pregnancy-related base, and this has risen to level of 6% currently uh, due to different factors that we are going to discuss. And uh, uh, this ectopic pregnancy also comprises a first, uh, uh, on this first trimester pregnancy, it accounts around some uh, mucosal year while there is uh, a list number of some mucosal layers along the ismic area and the interstitial area. So that has a significant clinical implication over a uh, fallopian tube. So as we all know, uh, the fate of this ectopic pregnancy could be three of it. That it could be tubal rupture, tubal abortion, as well as it could be spontaneously resolving ectopic pregnancy. So. Uh, as I have tried to explain, this region of the ampullary region has uh, some mucosal layers. So when these some mucosal layers are damaged due to different factors, okay, this fertilized ovum that's going to be uh, uh, destined to be here uh, will attach itself to the epithelium, to the epithelium, and then uh, finally it will enter into the muscularis layer, okay, the muscularis layer, and it plants there. And the same thing will happen to the ismic area, uh, rather than propagating down to the uterine cavity, okay? This fertilized ovum will stay there, enter into the muscularis layer, and it will uh, grow there. 
So this growth of these fertilized ovum at different levels of the uh, fallopian tube will result different implications. For example, if we see this ampullary region, if you see this ampullary region due to the widening of the ampullary area and uh, absence of this some mucosa lay, usually, usually uh, more than 85% of ampullary pregnancies they don't um, uh, burrow this, themselves into the muscular uh, the muscular wall. Rather, they dest they destined to abort through the fimbrial edge. But if you see the ismic area, the ismic area is totally absent uh, absent of this some mucosa layer. So this fertilized uh, ovum will usually burrow itself to the muscular layer, and usually it will destine to rupture. So by a rule, uh, if uh, uh, if there is a tubal rupture, the area is going to be ismic area. And if a mother came with a rupture, tubal rupture, at early few weeks of pregnancy, we always assume that it is going to be ismic area. And then, um, but if finally, if uh, a mother came after 14 weeks and so on, we usually suspect the ectopic pregnancy, the location of ectopic pregnancy could be interstitial region. And these figures, as you can see on the left side, it is a tubal rupture. And uh, on the left lower side, you can see a figure with an intact fallopian tube and with aborted uh, co product of conception from the fallopian tube. So pathogenesis wise, normally what is going to happen on uh, ectopic pregnancy is there is a damage to the tubal, uh, the fallopian tube. So damage to the fallopian tube could be caused by different factors, okay, different factors. So anything that's going to damage the, uh, the fallopian tube, the fallopian tube, which is specifically to the submucosal area, the submucosal, the epithelial area, which contains the plicates, the cilia that are really needed to propagate this uh, fertilized ovum, if they are damaged due to different factors, that could be one of the major pathogenesis of tubal ectopic pregnancy. So what are the things really uh, uh, damage this uh, tube? So uh, one of the major uh, cause of uh, tubal ectopic pregnancy is PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, which actually results in chronic salpingitis. So this next slide will, uh, will actually tell you the histologic part of chronic salpingitis, as you can see on the uh, right lower uh, image. This picture will uh, show you the chronic salpingitis. There is uh, attenuation and uh, damage of the plicase. As you can see, this is the epithelium. Okay, this is the epithelium. And on the epithelium, there are linings of plicase and cilia. This cilia and plicase will be blunted, attenuated. Okay, so this uh, will uh, affect the propagation and also. Uh, chronic salpingitis, it's a chronic process which affects the epithelium. The epithelium will be taken and there will, the wall of some, some mucosal layer or the mucosal layer will be filled with plasma cells and uh, lymphocytes. So uh, this, is a chron uh, this is a histologic feature evidence for uh, ectopic pregnancy. The other is the salpingitis ischemia, uh, ischemia nodosa. This is one of uh, the clinical, uh, one of the histologic evidence for uh, ectopic pregnancy whereby the tubal mucosa layer, layer will invite itself into the uh, myosalpix, okay? The myosalpix and this uh, will result in thickening of the muscularis layer of the uh, uh, tube. And the other uh, pathophysiologists are the factors inherent in the embryo that result in the premature implantation. This could be different factors, lecithin, integrin, cytokines, and prostaglandins, and also the depth of implantation of the gestational sac could also be of, uh, could also be one of the determining factor for ectopic pregnancy because I have said here before uh, on the ismic area the depth of implantation is very very small while uh, here in apulary region most of the time the fertilized uh, ovum do not burrow itself into the muscularis area rather it will destined to abort so this and other things could affect the uh, uh, the, the location of the location of the tubal pregnancy would affect the presentation of the uh, patient. So the other thing is uh, also whenever there is uh, in, in the histologic uh, finding of chronic, uh, there will be chronic uh, villi in the ruptured site, and in the cross findings you can you can have the uh, as you can see due to chronic obstruction of the. Uh, the fimbrial region, there will be uh, accumulation of blood in the 
uh, fallopian tube, which will be uh, appeared as a bluish uh, distension of the fallopian tube, like uh, hematosynthesis. In ultrasound, you can see uh, this empty uterus down there with uh, adenixal mass with uh, gestational sac in the yolk sac inside, which is a tubal ectopic pregnancy. So as I have said, other than the previous, uh, other than the pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, there are other major risk factors. A woman having uh, previous ectopic pregnancy is one of the major uh, risk factor because if she has one ectopic pregnancy, the risk of having subsequent ectopic pregnancy is around 10%. And if it, she has two or more, it's going to be more than 25%. So as are any surgeries uh, undergone over the tubes, like corrective surgeries, tubal sterilization, and others uh, could also be a major risk factor for the occurrence of tubal ectopic pregnancy. And uh, as you can see, you can go down there and see major risk factors that can affect uh, for the development of uh, ectopic pregnancy. So as we have said previously, if she has one ectopic pregnancy, the chance of having subsequent, pregnancy, subsequent ectopic pregnancy is around 10 to 25%. That doesn't mean that she is going to have a normal pregnancy, the chance of having this uh, normal pregnancy is around 50 to 80%. So the remaining will be infertile, okay? Infertile, so the risk is around seven to 13, uh, seven to 13 times of, uh, for having a subsequent uh, ectopic pregnancy. So clinical manifestation of ectopic pregnancy, usually uh, patients uh, do not appear to have clinical symptoms before uh, six weeks of uh, gestational age. But once they reach to six, before that, usually we find that incidentally while they are undergoing ultrasound evaluation for a routine examination. But uh, when they reach around six to eight weeks, they will try to manifest some symptoms. There are clinical trials that are used for uh, diagnosis of uh, ectopic pregnancy. These are abdominal pain, which is usually situated uh, over the uh, over the lower abdomen below the umbilicus it could be right uh, either on the right side or on the left side and usually they will uh, complain of amenorrhea and missed menses and also vaginal bleeding the vaginal bleeding could also could be uh, usually it's not uh, it's not the same as any other uh, patients like abortion patient or gtd patients it has peculiar features usually they will present with spotty like bleeding this could be due to the progesterone effect or it could be due to implant side bleeding. And so generally the pain is one of the major complaints of patients with atopic pregnancy, which is account to 95%, followed by the abdominal bleeding 60 to 80%. And on physical examination, we may find tenderness over the abdominal pelvic area. And also we may find cervical motion tenderness, posterior fornix could be bulgy due to hemoperitoneum and so on. And also, uh, due to hemoperitoneum, irritation of the phrenic nerve could, uh, uh, could present a patient with shoulder and neck pain, okay? And finally, if we don't have intervention, there will be vital sign derangement and they may end up in shock and daze, okay? So as you can see, the question is, how is ectopic, ectopic pregnancy diagnosed? So there are different modalities for the diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy. So uh, we can have uh, ultrasound finding, okay? It could be uh, either abdominal ultrasonography or uh, transvaginal sonography. But uh, if we use abdominal ultrasound, it's very hard to diagnose uh, uh, ectopic pregnancy before five to six weeks of gestational age. But if we have uh, this transvaginal sonography, we can uh, diagnose ectopic pregnancy as early as 4.5 weeks of Knowledge. So the positive predictive value of this uh, ectopic, uh, the positive predictive value of this transvaginal ultrasonography is 80%. The risk 20% could be due to any mass, hydrosulfings, any adenic mass could also uh, give a false positive result. So the predict value is uh, 80%. So as you can see here, there are the diff different images uh, uh, projected over the screen uh, on your screen. So the earliest sign of intrauterine pregnancy is, as you can see on the right side, it's trilaminar endometrial pattern. It is trilaminar because the uh, endometrium is thickened and ready to uh, accept any fertilized ovum. This is the earliest sign of the early signs that we can find uh, on the ultrasound using the transvaginal ultrasound. It is the trilaminar endometrial pattern. 
And then around 4.5 weeks, uh, we can have the so-called the intradecidual sign. As you can see here on the, the trilaminar sign, we'll have a very small uh, round area with, uh, no, with no hard ecogenic, ecogenic cream. So that is the early sign of intra the early sign of intra uh, uterine pregnancy, and then when the uh, gestational age progress to five weeks and so on, we will have the so-called the devil decidual sac sign, as you can see here. The devil decidual sac is formed by the decidual capsularis and decidual parietalis, and this is the early sign of. Uh, uh, in triterine pregnancy, so you can see the gestational sac. So when the gestational sac is added to this des double decidual sac sign, that is the evidence for triterine pregnancy. But as you can see down there, there are two uh, pictures with the pseudo sac and decidual list. These are uh, the signs that you can see both in triterine pregnancy as well as in the ectopic pregnancy. So these things could confuse uh, most of the time when we do uh, ultrasound evaluation which could be the sign for both ectopic pregnancy as well as both for uh, intrauterine pregnancy. Okay, so the other modality that we can see is the human chorionic gonadotropin or the HCG, the serum value of HCG. So this is very important. This is very important as you can see on the figure. This is a part, the, this is a, the curve that shows the level of uh, HCG during the uh, pregnancy, as you can see, around up to around five weeks of gestational age, as HCG will rise uh, in a curvilinear fashion, and then it goes slowly up to the ten weeks, and then gradually decline to have a plateau level to at around second third trimester. So this is a normal. Uh, this is a normal. Uh, a pattern of HCG level during pregnancy. So it's it's very good to know the level of HCG. Uh, the normal level of HCG in order to compare with ectopic pregnancy. So during ectopic pregnancy, usually this pattern is will be obliterated. Usually, there will be, there will be a slow rise of HCG, and or else double that there will be a plateau level. So it's very important to know the doubling of HCG. So when do we when do we expect the HCG to double? That minimum is thought to be around 1.4 to 2.1 days in early gestation. So in around 85% of viral pregnancies, the HCG will rise by at least 66% in the uh, 48 hours during 40 days of uh, pregnancy, the first five weeks. In uh, around 15%, the HCG will be uh, raised in less than uh, this value, 66%. Uh, in history, the slowest rise in, the X in the HCG around 48 hours is around 53%. So knowing this thing is very important because the level of rise, as I told you before, the level of rise for HCG uh, in ectopic pregnancy is more of a plateau level. We don't expect to double HCG uh, in ectopic within two days, rather we expect to double time in more than seven days. So knowing the doubling time of ectopic pregnancy is very, very important. So the other thing is we need to combine in order to diagnose ectopic pregnancy here. We, that we need to combine the transvaginal ultrasonography with that of the serum HCG value. So whenever we combine these things, it's called discriminatory zone. Discriminatory zone is a serum HCG level about which we can be able to identify gestational sac through uh, transvaginal sonography, okay? Or it, it could be through transabdominal ultrasonography. What it means is uh, whenever serum beta HCG in, in case of transvaginal ultrasonography, well, whenever the serum beta HCG reaches to 1500 to 2000 international unit per liter, okay, at this value we are expected to see a gestational sac intrauterine. That's what it means. So, in case of transabdominal ultrasound, the serum beta HCG will be more, it is around 6500 international per liter. So, this uh, moment we are going to see at intrauterine gestational sac. So, combining this serum HCG value with transvaginal ultrasonography we can expect, we can actually deal with uh, the, uh, the presence of ectopic pregnancy or not, okay? So, for example, if the discriminatory value, for example, this one, 1,500, uh, if it is above the discriminatory, if the HCG value, for example, if it is 3,000, okay, and if we don't be able to see intra-dimensional sac, we are going to expect something. If there is no intra-dimensional sac inside the uterus, and if the discriminatory zone is above 1,500, the possible differential diagnosis will be ectopic pregnancy or 
it could be non-viable intrauterine pregnancy, okay? So if the discriminatory zone is below that, below that, and if uh, it is absent, uh, it, means, it means whenever we see in, with transvaginal ultrasonography and if we don't find any gestational sac, if the discriminator zone as well is below the discriminator, below 1,500, what we are going to expect for, uh, is either it could be early in triatrine pregnancy or else it could be ectopic pregnancy or else it could be non-viable in uterine pregnancy. This is what we call it a pregnancy of unknown location, which means we don't know the location of the pregnancy. It, it could be either in triatrine, it could be viable and early, it could be non-viable in triatrine or else the more, it could be an ectopic pregnancy. So in this, uh, in this way, in this way, this will tell us to have adequate time uh, to, gi to give the pregnancy adequate time, at least 48 to 72 hours. And then we have to recheck uh, the ultrasound in order to find the location of pregnancy. So uh, the other modalities of investigation are the serum progesterone level, especially in case of pregnancy of unknown location, okay, we can use the serum progesterone level. If we have the value exceeding more than 25 nanogram per ml, uh, it is almost 92.5% sensitive to exclude this ectopic pregnancy, okay? And uh, if the value is below five nanogram, it's only 0.3% normal, uh, normal pregnancy. The chance of having normal pregnancy is only 0.3%. So it could be either ectopic pregnancy or non-viable pregnancy or dead fetus. The other thing is uh, about Doppler, uh, Doppler usage of Doppler. The usage of Doppler has increased the sensitivity of diagnosing both all ectopic pregnancy, failed intratrial pregnancy, as well as uh, normal intratrial pregnancy. For example, it will increase the sensitivity of diagnosing ectopic pregnancy by around 71 to 87% and failed intratrial pregnancy by 24 to 59% and normal intratrial pregnancy by 90 to 99%. So, uh, adding Doppler on our uh, diagnostic modality will improve the sensitivity. The other is QRH, as we have said previously, in case of pregnancy of unknown location, if we actually diagnose uh, non-viable pregnancy, if we, and if we don't know the location of pregnancy, there is a, a method uh, of knowing that. Of course, it is destructive of the, if there is any intratrine pregnancy, but what is going to be done is we are going to do uterine curate, we curate the uterus, and then we are going to find the tissue and we'll suspend it over the saline, okay? So if we find decidual tissue, decidual tissue, uh, usually these are pregnancy related, so they usually don't float, they either is precipitate, so that was uh, <clears throat> a pregnancy, and the other is Chorionic villi, the chorionic villi, uh, usually the sensitivity of this curatage is not 100%, even though the sensitivity and specificity technique is around 90%, but we cannot surely say it's 100% by just uh, floating a sample over a line. So we actually use additional methods of uh, diagnosing that. So we have to use a, a histologic confirmation method or we have to use a serial beta HCG measurement so that we can diagnose ectopic pregnancy, okay? So the other method is uh, uh, kudosynthesis, okay? So in advanced setups, in advanced setup, in advanced uh, disease uh, setup where uh, there is rupture of uh, the ectopic pregnancy resulting in hemoperitoneum, okay? So as we have said in the clinical presentation, the posterior uh, sac, okay? This one, the posterior fornix will be bulged out. So, we can take sample uh, through the posterior uh, cool sac. It's called coolosynthesis. Coolosynthesis. We can use a syringe and the tenaculum to hold the posterior lip of the fornix upward, and we can use a spiral needle in order to aspirate content of the cool sac. Okay. So uh, after aspirating the content, we are going to analyze it. Usually, we uh, suspect ectopic pregnancy if the a hematocrit level is uh, more than 15%, okay? That will tell us that there is act bleeding in the uh, hemoperitoneum, which actually could be due to ectopic pregnancy or it could be due to any uh, ruptured corpus lutea, okay? Um, <clears throat> the other, uh, the most uh, important and the minimally invasive technique of diagnosing ectopic pregnancy is the laparoscopic method. It's actually more diagnostic and uh, 
as well as therapeutic, okay? So we are going to use a direct visualization as well as uh, direct visualization of the fallopian tube and the pelvic. This is, uh, as you can see, uh, this is uh, the upper image is more of the paranomic view of the laparoscopy, okay? We can see directly visualize the, the fallopian tube, the uterus and other parts of the adenexa. And then we actually diagnose as well we are going to uh, make a therapeutic intervention directly, immediately during the time of the procedure. Okay, this is one of uh, minimal invasive technique and most important diagnostic modality. The other is MRI. MRI is not actually uh, the most preferred method of diagnosing MRI, but because due to its... Uh, uh, yeah. Due to its... Uh, uh, okay, due to its uh, expensiveness, so uh, it's a cost, uh, it's not cost effective, but the most important aspect of using MRI is it's very important to diagnose intra uh, to differentiate intra-trime pregnancy from that of Cornwall and interstitial pregnancy as well as interstitial uh, intra-trime pregnancy from cervical pregnancy whenever there is a dilemma and confusion, MRI has a place there. Uh, okay, actually we have talked this one. So coming to the management option of <clears throat> ectopic pregnancy, there are uh, three options of uh, management for ectopic pregnancy. We have the expectant management, the medical management, as well as the surgical management options. So coming to the uh, expectant management option, there are uh, candidates to you, candidates of patients who should undergo expectant management. And this one, uh, the patient has to be asymptomatic. She has to be free, uh, free from any pain and she has to be, she has to have normal vital sign, hemodynamically stable, okay? And always, always has to be tubal ectopic pregnancy, tubal ectopic pregnancy. And uh, also the serum uh, beta HCG level has to be less than or equals 200 milli international uh, units per ml or else down, it has to be declining, okay? It has to be declining or plateau level, okay? That is a candidate criteria based on the, the serum finding serum beta ECG finding also. And, uh, and the other thing is the uh, ectopic mass has to be at least uh, not greater than uh, 3.5 centimeter, okay? And there shouldn't be any sign of complications like rupture of the ectopic resulting in intra-abdominal bleeding, hemoperitoneum, and other findings, okay? And also most important, the patient has to understand the the, 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 the problem that she has got, okay? She has to know the risks of uh, 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 ectopic pregnancy and also she has to be compliant enough to come to the follow-up strictly okay strictly and she has to come at any time t during the follow-up okay so the follow-up on expectant management will be every 48 hours until we have got a declining level of serum beta hcg and then weekly we can follow this patient until we have undetectable level of serum beta hcg which is less than five and uh, the other medic, uh, the other is a medical management of method, uh, medical management of ectopic pregnancy. This is usually undertaken with uh, the drug called methotrexate. It is one of the anti-metabolites. It's a folate antagonist. This drug will uh, usually uh, bind to the, the enzyme called dihydrofolate reductase, and it will uh, actually interrupt the synthesis of amino acids and purine nucleotides. It will affect, basically it will affect the DNA, DNA, DNA synthesis and repair as well as cell membrane. So this uh, anti-metabolite usually affects uh, specific areas of the body, like specific cells and tissues of the body, like that of actively proliferating sex, like bone marrow cells, uh, buccal, intestinal, mucosa, respiratory, epithelium, okay, malignant cells and trophoblastic tissues. These are the most important areas while what uh, this methotrexate could result uh, problem. That's why the, when we see most of the side effects of methotrexate, it's related to these regions, related to these regions, okay? It will cause uh, blood cell damage, blood cell derangement, which will cause uh, mucositis, any damage on the mucosal surfaces, respiratory problems, okay, and so on. And this is a drug which is only given in IM approach because <clears throat> Usually, if it is given in IV approach, the effect will be rapid and the adverse effect will be very high. And we don't ad advise to give it in the oral uh, because of the absorption will be very delayed. So the appropriate way of giving this uh, drug is through IM approach. 
So when we see the contraindications for the drug, there are absolute contraindications, there are relative contraindications. You can go through this uh, slide, but the most important thing is we don't have to have uh, hepatic and renal failures, okay? And there shouldn't be intrauterine pregnancy and ruptured ectopic pregnancy, okay? So what are the candidates? We have seen the candidates for, ecto uh, uh, for those of the expectant management, and there are candidates for medical management. As that of the expectant management, the patients with medical management should have a stable vital sign, and there should be no rupture of ectopic pregnancy, and the, there should be no complaints, okay? The, the patient has to be complaint enough for the follow-up, and the HCG value has to be less than 5,000, and there should be no cardiac activity seen uh, during ultrasonography, okay? This is very important because uh, uh, this is actually a relative contraindication for medical management of ectopic pregnancy, okay? This is a study, a systematic review, which compared the cut point of methotrexate usage for uh, uh, medical management. So uh, this study has shown the 5,000 milli international per unit per ml is a cutoff point to uh, use because the failure rate, rate will be high when the HCG value is more than 5,000, okay? So the contraindication will be more of the reverse of this uh, uh, in uh, candidate criteria, like the unstable vital signs, derangement, hemoperitone more than 300 ml, and also hypersensitivity to the, to the drugs like methotrexate, and uh, if there is any coexistent vital intrauterine pregnancy, okay? For example, heterotropic pregnancy, both in triterine and ex we don't use this medical management because it will affect the viable triterine pregnancy. A mother with breastfeeding, unwilling to complain, okay? And if she is not able to come to the medical institution with a timely manner, that's a contraindication to use a medical management, okay? So these are the things that we have to use a pretreatment testing on uh, evaluation and precautions during therapy. There shouldn't be no intercourse and uh, no new conception, okay, because of the risk of rupture of the uh, tubal pregnancy. There should be no pelvic examination, specifically bimanual examination. There should be no sunlight exposure because methotrexate could cause dermatosis, dermatitis, and there shouldn't be no usage of this um, uh, vitamins and folic acid, and we have to avoid non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, okay? So, how is the protocol to use methotrexate? There are different protocols. Uh, the one dose protocol, two dose protocol, and fixed multi dose protocol. The single dose protocol, usually we are going to give them on the day one 50 milligram per meter square, and we have to advise them to come on day four and day seven. And at day four and day seven, we are going to measure the serum beta HCG level. So if the serum beta HCG level is greater than 15%, we are going to continue the follow-up every week, okay, until non-pregnant state. But if the serum beta is just less than 15%, we have to uh, administer another dose of uh, methotrexate on day four and day seven, okay? So uh, we usually go consider surgical management if the HCG does not decrease after two doses of uh, uh, management with single dose protocol, okay? The two dose protocol, we usually give on day one, and day seven, day four, okay? And then we're going to appoint them on day seven and we are going to measure the serum beta ICG. So as out of day one, 15% greater decrement is very important. So we are going to follow weekly. But if it is 15% uh, less uh, decrement, then we have to give on day seven another dose and we can continue up to day 14, okay? Day 14, uh, we can continue giving this 50 milligram per meter square of uh, metho methotrexate, okay? So generally after four doses, we can decline this medical management and we can consider surgical management, okay? So fixed multi-dose uh, protocol, this is an eight, uh, an eight day, pro an eight day uh, medication, which means eight day to mean four days of uh, methotrexate regimen and four days of folinic acid uh, regimen. This folinic acid is important in order to uh, downgrade the adverse effect of methotrexate, okay? So methotrexate could be given at day one, three, five, and seven, and in, alternatively, we can give folinic acid at day two, four, six, and eight, okay? So just like the single dose, double dose, we are going to measure the serum beta ICG and the decrement greater than 50%, we have to discontinue administration of methotrexate and measure the HCG level weekly, okay? So if the HCG level does not decrease after four doses, we still consider surgical management, okay? 
So this is a study, actually, the study done, uh, the systematic review meta-analysis used to compare double dose and multi-dose regimen with a single dose regimen. And the finding was impressive. Uh, the double dose uh, methotrexate protocol was found to be efficient and safe alternative for single dose protocol. The, the reason because is the double dose will actually take the efficacy of the multiple dose regimen and also it will cover up the adverse effect of single dose methotrexate. So most of the time, the uh, protocols advise to use the double dose methotrexate uh, uh, regimen protocol. Okay. So surveillance of uh, when when we are when are we going to say treatment failure failure is to decrease less, at least fifteen percent from day four to day seven based on actually this uh, treatment failure is based on the uh, single dose two dose and fixed dose protocol as we have uh, said previously the HCG value actually in the single dose if it does not decrease after two doses. The single dose uh, based on single dose uh, protocol it is uh, considered to be failure and we have to go for surgical management based on the two doses after four doses if there is no decrement we are going to consider uh, surgical management and the same thing will happen for fixed multiple dose uh, protocol okay and other thing is the resolution usually uh, your resolution is usually completed two to four weeks but it can take up to eight weeks this we'll see it in the next few slides Okay, so the other adverse effect of methotrexate is, uh, as I tried to depict uh, previous slides, okay, the things, the organs that are going to be affected will usually manifest, nausea, vomiting, stomatitis, it will affect the mucosal areas, okay, vaginal spotting, okay, abdominal pain, elevation of liver enzymes, these are the most important uh, <clears throat> Uh, adverse effects of uh, systemic uh, methotrexate usage. The other is if pregnancy occurs while a, a, a mother is on treatment with medication with methotrexate, there is so-called methotrexate embryopathy, which is a comp uh, which comprises of microcephaly, cranius, uh, synostosis, tetralogy of phthalates, pulmonary uh, valve atresia, limb reduction defect, and syndactility. These are the syndromes associated with methotrexate uh, toxicity, teratogenicity. Okay, so the other thing is what will happen if uh, we have seen what is going to happen uh, while uh, a woman is pregnant and uh, usage of uh, methotrexate. So uh, if she is on medical treatment with methotrexate, what has, what has to be done is we have to avoid uh, pregnancy to occur at least for 4 to 12 weeks. Uh, up to that, it will creel out. So at least for 4 to 12 weeks, a uh, woman shouldn't be using any... Uh, uh, uh she has to be at least need, need not to be pregnant okay so the other thing is methotrexate has no adverse effect on subsequent uh, fertilities okay the other is surgical management options we have uh, conservative surgical options and radical surgeries so the conservative surgical options are the salpingiotomy salpingiostomy and fimbrial expression okay and the radical surgical approach is just taking out the tube, which is called salpingectomy. So this can be accomplished either using open laparotomy method or laparoscopically. And uh, the choice of using one of the methods is based on the clinical status of the patient, the desire for future uh, fertility, and the extent of fallopian tube damage, as well as the extent of rise of serum beta HCG could also affect the choice of um, uh, one of the method of surgeries, okay? So salpingiostomy, as you can see on the picture, we are going to make a small incision over the ectopic mass, like one to 1.5 centimeter. And then we are going to take out all the contents using high pressure irrigation. And then the bleeder sites will be just cauterized, okay? We don't need to uh, close it, okay? We don't need to close it, okay? So usually if this, uh, the serum beta HCG is more than 6,000, we are not going to consider this method of uh, surgery because the implantation of this uh, uh, fertilized organ may be extensive and there will be a persistent trophoblasts, okay? So persistent trophoblasts are common in case of salpingiostomy, around 5 to 20%. So usually whenever we do this salpingiostomy, we are going to provide postoperatively one milligram per kg of methotrexate as a prophylactic, okay? So the other is the factors that increase the risk of persistent ectopic pregnancy if it is less than two centimeter, early therapy with before 42 minutes, 12 days, ex serum beta HCG more than 3,000, okay? And implantation medial to sites are most factors that increase 
persistent of ectopic pregnancy after salpingotomy. Okay, the other is salpingotomy. This procedure is not being done currently, but what is going to be done? Just we made incision. We are going to irrigate all the contents, and finally, we are going to close with uh, delayed absorbable sutures. Okay. The other is a salpingectomy, which is the most commonly done procedure. We are going to take out all the tubes, as you can see from the figure. Okay. Uh, this is very important, actually, as compared to there are studies done uh, which compare salpingotomy with salpingectomy, and this study actually compares it and it says there is no actually fertility difference after doing salpingectomy and salpingotomy. So it's better to do salpingotomy rather doing salpingotomy also pro is protective for other tumors like ovarian tumor and so on. So uh, this is a study which compares it's a meta-analysis that compares the two. Okay, so. Uh, when are we going to do salpingectomy rather than salpingostomy? Whenever we have bleeding, which is uncontrollable, and uh, recurrent pregnancy over that tube, the same, the same tube with a recurrent pregnancy. And if there is any severely damaged uh, tube, we are going to consider salpingectomy, okay? And also the size of the mass, which is more than five centimeters, we are going to consider salpingectomy rather than salpingostomy, okay? And also if a woman has a child, uh, completed childbearing and if there is any need of uh, using in vitro fertilization, we are going to consider this falcingiotomy and falcingiotomy. Okay, this is a study that you can go through it. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I've finished now. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. David. Uh, so participants, uh, if I, th I think I saw some participants raising their hands. So I, uh, uh, if, you, if you guys have any questions, instead of raising your hands, you can write your questions in the Q&A session of the, uh, the Zoom. Okay, I think we have one question uh, yeah. uh, on the, on the Q&A section. Yeah. Um, uh, it says, what will be the treatment option when twin pregnancy happened? And one is intrauterine and one is ectopic pregnancy. Okay, so the term is not twin pregnancy, rather, we call it a heterotopic pregnancy, which means one uh, pregnancy is going to be intrauterine and the other will be in the extrauterine uh, site. It could be either in the tubal area or the abdominal area or somewhere other than the endometrial cavity. So we call this type of uh, ectopic pregnancy a heterotopic pregnancy. Uh, I couldn't be able to cover those sections because it's uh, difficult to finish within a limited period of time. So generally the management option will be surgical management because, uh, yes, because uh, if we use any medical management, we are going to affect the viable intrauterine pregnancy, which is actually destined to be uh, get, uh, get grow and uh, be alive. So we usually uh, perform uh, uh, surgical management, surgical management for this type of pregnancies. And uh, actually, this kind of pregnancy is very rare. Uh, what is what the other question is? What about methotrexate treatment in our country? There is methotrexate treatment in our country when we are actually using that method of uh, treatment uh, uh, currently. Uh, okay. Okay, the other question is features that we see on ultrasound of ectopic pregnancy. Okay, so uh, features that we see on ultrasound on ectopic pregnancy, as I have tried to explain previously, uh, ultrasound finding will be the intrauterine uh, as early as possible, as early as uh, uh, three weeks, we can uh, see a trilaminal pattern, a trilaminal pattern. So, uh, less than uh, serum beta SG, less than 40, less than 1,500, and uh, the trilaminal pattern seen in trilaminal pregnancy will have a sensitivity of 41% to diagnose ectopic pregnancy. And other uh, signs like the pseudo, the pseudo sac sign and uh, the decidual signs also one of the features that we can see on ectopic pregnancy. And also there are uh, histologic findings that we can see on the histologic uh, part, on the histology of the fallopian tube. Mostly, mostly but there will be there will be intrauterine. There will be no intrauterine pregnancy, but they will have uh, adenic salmas that is going to have a sac as well as uh, the yolk sac, and even the fetus could be possibly seen. And if it is ruptured, we have 
organized mass on the adenic sites, and uh, even in advanced case, we could have hemoperitoneum and so on in case of ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Okay, is the fertility the same after ectopic pregnancy? As I have tried to explain, with one ectopic pregnancy, the risk of recurrence will be around uh, 20, up, up, to 10 to, up to 10 per 10 to 15 percent. So this means uh, the she could be pregnant around 50 to 80 percent, 50 to 80 percent. Uh, the rest will be, she could be infertile as well. She could be infertile as well. But one thing that you have to know is the recurrence will be increased with one ectopic pregnancy and with a subsequent ectopic pregnancy. This could actually decrease the fertility rates. But uh, one thing also we have to know is the subsequent intrauterine pregnancy rate will be 50 to 80%. And uh, what is the gold standard diagnostic modality for ectopic pregnancy? It's a laparoscopic uh, method is a gold standard, but uh, still uh, it's possible to diagnose as uh, combining this transvaginal sonography with uh, uh, serum beta IC level with discriminatory zone. Uh, properly follow up, we can diagnose the, uh, ectopic pregnancy before it gets uh, ruptured. What type of dose protocol do we use in Ethiopia? The, the guideline, there is no a strict guideline to use, uh, there is no such Ethiopian guideline to use uh, the strict uh, dose protocol for ectopic pregnancy, but uh, it's as we have said, as we have said from the studies, the first dose, the first dose protocol, the two double dose protocol and multi-dose protocol, studies show double dose protocol is uh, mostly mostly uh, effective because it will take the efficacy of uh, the multiple dose protocol as well. Uh, it will take the adverse effect of uh, a single dose protocol. So it's better uh, to use a double dose protocol, double dose protocol if you have a proper complaint patients for follow-up. Okay, what could be the reason for HCG? should be less than 5,000 milli international units as a candidate for uh, medical management. So as we have said, uh, usually, as we have said uh, previously, candidate criteria for uh, uh, expectant management of ectopic pregnancy is the serum beta HCG has to be uh, mostly less than uh, 200 milli international unit per ml. And for that of candidate criteria for, uh, medi uh, for medical management has to be at least less than 5,000 milli international per ml units. The reason behind this, whenever the serum beta HCG level is increasing exponentially, the risk, it is correlated with the extent of invasion of the fallopian tube. For example, uh, the, 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 this uh, fertilized ovum usually will penetrate the muscularis region, okay, the muscularis region, and applying this medical management on this uh, level of serum beta HCG could actually uh, uh, result in failure, failure rate as compared to uh, failure rate. Uh, we, as you have said previously, with the first dose, second dose, third dose, it will eventually will result in failure rate of uh, medical management. So usually to have uh, proper medical, uh, proper response for medical management, we need to have uh, serum beta HCG, which is less than 200 milli international units per uh, ml. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, doctor. Okay. Uh, can we uh, can we choose only one last question and then uh, answer that, and after that we'll proceed to the quiz uh, section of the Zoom. Okay. Okay. Let me uh, let me have one question. Uh, uh, is there a, is is it necessary to have MRI for ectopic pregnancy? Well, uh, as I have tried to explain previously. Uh, MRI is uh, really is, uh, expensive, expensive for ectopic pregnancy, but it has a place at some points, like for example, in order to differentiate intrauterine pregnancy from that of coronal pregnancy or interstitial pregnancy, we may have some kind of con confusion and dilemmas in this uh, manner. And also intrauterine pregnancy from cervical pregnancy, we may even have some confusion strain, uh, there as well. So in order to clear out these things, we could have, we could have actually, we could have used uh, this MRI, but as we have said, the most important diagnostic modality is uh, transvaginal sonography. Uh, I think uh, we can, uh, that's a place to use MRI, otherwise it's not important. I think it's done. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dawit, sacrificing your time. 
and energy to present to us this amazing slide. Doc, if you, if you have any last words. Um, yeah, uh, my last word could be ectopic pregnancy uh, is one of the major gynecologic emergencies um, which actually affect or which is actually increasing nowadays due to different factors related to infections like PID and so on. So women or uh, girls uh, actually in those in the reproductive age you know, has to have precautions, precautions and so on. Okay, so that we can prevent because the major the major reason for having this ectopic pregnancy is PID. So at least the risk factors for PID are known. So uh, having known this risk factor could actually, uh, uh, or having this discharge and so on, and early treatment could actually elevate these problems.